hopefully your commute brought you against them and, um, and that you had a nice easy commute. And we tried to pick a place that was uh, easy for all the different, um, oh, I'm not sure we need it. Uh, that would, would be easy for all of you to get to, and so we welcome you to Pasco County, and we welcome you to uh, North Point, one of uh, one of our premier employment centers. Um, so uh, I think we'll, well, it says welcome and introductions, and I don't even remember. Do we do we go around the table and all introduce ourselves? Okay, so we'll start over here with Beth, and I, I don't know if you need the mic, but you can. I'll, I'll speak loudly. I'm okay. Beth Alton with the Hillsborough MPO. Pat Camp, Hillsborough, County Commissioner, County by the Heart, NPL, I'm trying to do it. Too far. Kimberly Everman, Hillsborough County Board of County Commission, also on Heart and NPL, and we have a dozen of them, but that's good. <laughs> I just wear one hat. <laughs> yeah, and a really Beth. good one. <laughs> yeah, Beth Lumber with Heart. My name's Sean Sullivan with the Regional Planning Council. I'm John Miller with Pasco MPO. And I'm Commissioner Starkey with uh, Pasco MPO. And <coughs> Commissioner Mariano will be here in about 10 minutes. Good morning. I'm Pitt Blanton with Forest Bells. Dave Eggers, Pinellas County Commission. Janet Fogg, Pinellas County Commission. David Green, T. Barta. David Gwynn, FDOT. Cassandra Borchers, PSTA. Hilary Lehman, Florida Pinellas. Manny Latchmedi, MPO staff, Pasco County. Tia Gorman, Pasco County MPO. Michael Marino, Washer Alliance. Cindy Rackin, T. Barta. Bill Johnson, T. Barta, CMC Chair. Ann Hughes with the Washer Alliance. Christina Kopp, Thea. Sharon Calvert, local blocker. Pete Franco, citizen of Pinellas County, South Pasadena. Laura Lawson, I work with Commissioner of Pips Office. Steve Diaz, all the way from Hernando County. Hernando <laughs> Citrus, <laughs> NPO. Dr. McKinley, and her class here in the field. Harris Petsalieris, Pasco, NPO. Michelle Miller, A2, Mr. Stokey. Tom Lucero, Beach Trank, Clearwater. John Tixbury, Beach Trank, Clearwater. Bill Ball, Wittendale, Oliver. Christine Huntis, T. Barta. Ralph Blair, Intergovernmental Affairs Officer, Pasco County. Andy Taylor, Legislative Aid to Pasco Commissioner Mike Moore. Kelsey Fabra, Fort Pinellas. Renee Callow, FDOT. Kelly Bradley, DOT. Richard Moss, FDOT. And McKinney, FDOT. Roger Roscoe, FDOT. Alex Steady, Hillsborough County Infrastructure Growth Planning. Caitlin Johnston, Tampa Bay Times. Dave Sobush, Tampa Bay Partnership. Tom Brown, City Center. Ron Weaver, Starnes Weaver Law Firm. Nate Gautful, at DOT. Stephen Benson, at DOT. Okay, I think we got everybody, and again, welcome to Pasco. At this time, I'm going to call for public comment, and the first thing we have is Pete. That's that, it's Sharon, and then. Should go to the podium now. To the podium. Yeah, Hi, good morning. Um, my name is Pete Franco, and uh, I'm a citizen of uh, Pinellas County, South Pasadena. And what brought me up today was I had noticed on the NPO site that you had uh, the resolution from um, South Pasadena City. And uh, I basically just wanted to first acknowledge our commissioners for putting that resolution together. Um, it represents quite a bit, um, many, many people who I've spoken to in South Pasadena and actually throughout St. Pete Beach and parts of St. Pete City. And we have strong opposition to the lane removals with respect to the CABRT. And uh, my comments mostly today are directed um, to you, Mr. Gwynn, and in Ellis County, um, uh, there is strong opposition to these lane removals, and I don't think it's—I don't think the message is coming up the board, and um, I think that there's a lot of confusion uh, about um, about this. Um, in communicating with many people in South Pasadena, um, it's not just—I mean, I'm coming up here as one person, but. It's very widespread that this is not wanted at all. And specifically, the BAT lane removals and the extreme monster buses and the number of them, but especially the lane removals. South Pasadena clogs at the drop of a hat, and to put these in will radically hurt, hurt us. So, 
I don't want to just keep going on, but this is mostly for Mr. Gwynn and Pinellas County to know that we do not want this. I mean, this is a grant program for new starts. This can be stopped. And uh, I don't know who's telling you that you want. I know that there's um, quite a few from the Chamber of Commerce. There are lobbyist groups that are pushing very hard for this. But respectfully, we don't want this. Regular buses, great. Support that. And I'll just add that I spoke to uh, Senator Brandis about this. He supports moving projects forward in general. He supports buses. He does not support the lane removals as part of this program. So I wanted to just give you the I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak since the resolution was on your agenda today. I wanted to make sure someone represents this. Quite a few of the citizens asked uh, South Pasadena City to do this. So I wanted to make sure and represent it and make sure that uh, you, Mr. Quinn, get this person to person. Clear? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, we have Sharon. Uh, good morning. I'm Sharon Calvert, and I live in Pinellas County in Tierra Verde. And I also want to express my opposition. I've been here before. The Central Avenue BRT is not a regional project. You can call any driveway, it eventually hooks to an interstate, a regional project. This is not a regional project. The opposition for this uh, project is growing um, not only, as uh, Pete Franco stated in South Pasadena, but in St. Pete Beach, who never agreed to fund or support this. I would suggest you watch the last two months of St. Pete Beach Council meetings to just see the opposition where the room was filled with standing room only, people outside watching, opposing this project. There are too many issues with it. It was, uh, it was a misleading uh, submittal to the FTA who stated that St. Pete Beach was part of it. And on top of that, PSTA's financial position has been declining, the ridership has been declining, and they need to get their own house in order first, of which they never did because during their 2014 Remite Pinellas, they stated that they would have to do that if they didn't get that passed. It was not passed, they did not do it, um, and now they're pursuing a $42 million transit service that is not needed and not wanted. So I ask you that you take this project out of the TMA priorities. The second issue is regarding Hillsborough County. This organization uh, came together, I believe, to say you're going to speak as a region. You're not. And you need to be honest about it. When the study was done as a regional long-range planning, they put the scenarios out there. One of them is basically tearing down about 10 miles of 275 and replacing it with a transit corridor. That came in last. Here's the picture. The data is there. But the Hillsborough MPO is not being an honest broker in all this. They, on May 8th at their meeting, uh, voted to use federal funding to study tearing down a federal interstate that serves as a major evacuation route just as we we're going into hurricane season and as part of the Florida uh, SIS system. Over 250,000 people use that corridor every day. Um, it takes away my neighbors who have cancer they need to get to Moffitt. It takes away students in Pinellas County that have classes in you at Tampa campus. It takes away veterans who need to get to the VA hospital. There needs to be some sanity here. And what I'd like to see is I think there's some real issues in this room, and I suggest that this, this organization, which is not legally sanctioned, be disbanded until Hillsborough County stops pursuing such nonsense. Um, and I will say the opposition, uh, there is a group who, who has been supporting this, basically stated recently, we need highway expansion to stop, make more congestion so that car travel is painful. That is the agenda that is now being pursued by the Hillsborough MPO. In addition to that, the Hillsborough MPO decided to host an event with media on Monday, and it not only includes their members, um, Hart and Mr. Gwen, you are invited, but it also includes a, com a political committee. This event has now been politicized, and what I ask Ms. Alden is, if you're going to have a political event, 
please invite the other side. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Well, good morning, everyone. Tom Lucero, of Beach Train and Clearwater. Uh, last week, we received a call from our vendor, uh, Skytrain, with an announcement that they had shipped the milk components from the foundry to a site in San Antonio, Texas, where they will be erecting the demo track for the Skytrain uh, MagLab system. We expect uh, next month, and since there's no meeting of this group next month, uh, I'll share this with you now. We're expecting uh, next month to hear word that the system is up and operating in the, uh, in the track, demonstrating the uh, flight characteristics of the Skytrain uh, technology. So I just wanted to share that news with you, and uh, uh, we plan to, to make our way to uh, San Antonio to uh, participate in the uh, unveiling of this technology, and uh, we'll keep, as best we can, we'll keep everyone informed of the progress of it. Thank you. Great news. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else who uh, wants to address? Go ahead, Mark. That's right. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. I do not want to disband this group. You're doing great things and continue to do great things. I do, however, want to speak to the Interstate 275 North of downtown Tampa. If Tuesday night at 6 o'clock in the Transportation <coughs> Improvement Program, the MPO um, and the various commissioners and city council members and other officials decide what to do about our I-275. We desperately need to add a lane in each direction north of, of downtown to I-275, not only for hurricane evacuation, which is crucial in life, threatening this very week, and for the next six months, we'll be under the constant threat that we need great hurricane evacuation, and we need it to be two additional lanes, one in each direction, north of downtown on I-275, to remain in the TIP, not to be removed from the TIP. Secondly, the neighbors have a right to be protected, as I have urged it, uh, on occasion. This neighborhood needs to be protected, but it doesn't need to be protected as far as it comes to the right of way. It's not going to be expanded. As I understand it, these new two lanes, one in each direction, north of downtown, I-275, does not require additional right of way. Thirdly, there have been 1,500 crashes in the neighborhood of the interchange in downtown Tampa. 1,500. Not 400 or 800 or 1,200, but 1,500 crashes a year. That particular 250,000 people just alluded to by another speaker, thank you. Those 250,000 people desperately need not just a hurricane evacuation, not just to try to minimize those 1,500 crashes and to end those 1,500 crashes, but also to be considered in the fact that the federal government considers our interchange for $1.3 billion around the Tampa airport, they consider it in tandem with downtown, and if they continue to consider it in tandem with downtown, then we need to get our act together with respect to downtown and I-275 North in order for those two lanes, one in each direction, without a different right of way, to enable the hurricane evacuation, minimize or reduce those 1,500 crashes, be sensitive to the neighborhood, and the legitimate concerns of that neighborhood must be honored in the process, therefore no additional right of way, and finally, as I understand it, the current proposal is a compromise, a good compromise, a worthy compromise, because it does not involve tow lanes. Those will be three lanes and will not involve the question of whether they should be tow or free. And therefore, I respectfully request that you continue to send your calls to action with respect to the actions of 6 p.m., June 11, the Transportation Improvement Program of Hillsborough County to save our interstate north I-275. Thank you, Ron. Anybody else? Okay, so we're going to move on with our agenda, and uh, we are going to talk about the F, F dot funding capabilities and restrictions. I'm going to turn it over to the F dot staff. All right, well, we have some folks here who know a lot more about the funding than I do, and they're going <laughs> to, I'll probably learn a lot myself, but Stephen Benson here is going to be our lead presenter, and uh, Stephen, many of you probably know, he's been very active in a lot of our transportation planning projects with the MPOs. And uh, feel free to ask him any questions. He's got a whole cadre of folks here that are experts behind him, so we should be able to answer any questions that you have. Hmm? Okay, great. Uh, can everybody hear me with the microphone? Or should I talk to the microphone? Yeah. Okay. All right. So, um, so the purpose of this presentation is to provide you with an overview of the revenue sources that are available to FDOT. Uh, what the purpose is of the five-year work program in allocating and programming funds based upon rules and laws. 
who is responsible for managing and overseeing the funding, and also a brief overview of the transit-specific and transit-eligible sources of funding at the state and the federal level. I'm going to provide the overview uh, on the front end of how the funding comes in, and Lane is going to provide an overview uh, more on the back end of what types of programs are available uh, as, a uh, as a result of the specific emphasis on transit. So uh, the Federal Highway Trust Fund revenues all flow through uh, DOT. Some of those revenues end up going to local agencies or to MPOs, but everything actually comes through the FDOT's work program and through the budget and gets uh, approved by the legislature. Unlike most states, FDOT's work program is a majority state funded though. And this is really important because it allows in Florida us to have a lot of flexibility with how uh, we spend funds and so uh, that's just a really important thing to, to note. Uh, the federal portion of the work program is funded primarily by gasoline tax. Uh, federal trust fund discretionary programs are distributed down by population to the metropolitan areas based upon proportion and share. So this is where the TMA comes in and why the TMA is so important is because a lot of the federal funds come down specifically for the Tampa Bay TMA, not specific to an individual MPO. So it's important that the TMA gets together and decides what the priorities are of all the MPOs because that is what the Fed say the funding is for. It's for the region, it's not specifically for an MPO. The state portion of the work program is funded uh, via a combination of fuel taxes, and which is gas and diesel, and then also motor vehicle fees. And the state trust fund discretionary programs are distributed by a statutory formula, uh, which is either a proportionate share of population or invested back in the areas in which the taxes and fees were actually collected if it's, if it's a fee. So the primary funding sources, as I said, are, are user fees, so the, the taxes uh, for fuel, uh, vehicle license and registration fees, rental car surcharge, uh, surcharges, uh, tolls on the, uh, the highway system, transit revenues at the local level, and then also uh, taxes on trucks, uh, on, on truck users at the federal level. Uh, property, property related taxes are also important, but they're not the bulk. The bulk comes from user fees. Uh, and then there is a small uh, amount of fu funding that does come from other sources, but that's uh, a small proportion compared to the others. Uh, as far as the fuel tax rates go, um, there are different amounts for each level of government. At the federal level, the fuel tax is 18.4 cents per gallon for gasoline and 24.4 cents per gallon on diesel. The uh, state fuel tax rate in Florida is 20.8 cents per gallon, and the different colors uh, on the state and local bars there represent different types of fuel taxes, all of which have different statutory authority and what's even more important, different rules and regulations for how that funding is supposed to be spent. So a lot of the restrictions that we face in the work program with how money is spent is based upon how the revenue is collected and what the law says that that revenue can be used for. Okay, so looking at the revenue sources and how it kind of is distributed, um, you can see the federal revenues on the left and the state revenues on the right. Um, almost 90% of the, uh, the revenue at the federal level comes from fuel taxes. Uh, but at the state level, only 60% comes from fuel taxes. The rest come from motor vehicle fees uh, and some of the other dock stamps, rental cars, and aviation. Uh, the purpose of this chart is not to confuse you. This is actually, uh, this is actually this is a joke. Uh, yeah, this is actually a really great flowchart. We, we like this flowchart because it, it actually lays it all out pretty pretty clearly, um, <laughs> sad. Um, but I want you to kind of pay particular attention to uh, where it says transit programs in red, because we're going to follow the errors and show where the revenue sources for transit come from, and then actually at the top it shows you what the state sources of funding are that feed into that. So the transit programs are in red, and there are four pink boxes that feed into that. First is the State Transportation Trust Fund. There's a, a set amount of money off the top that's taken out of the trust fund and put uh, aside for transit programs. There's also the mass transit account of the Federal Highway Trust Fund, uh, of course, that comes down and that goes into the transit programs box, as well as uh, individual county transportation trust funds. And then also, on the bottom right, it's in the, there's, there's the optional uh, charter to county or regional transportation system surtax that was just passed. So um, that kind of gives you an overview. And if you follow the arrows, we'll make sure you have this slide. You can we can see uh, where all the revenue actually comes from because it all, it all feeds into each of those boxes. So it, it's, if you spend some time to look at it, it does make sense, I promise. But uh, <laughs> just don't sweat too hard. So funding allocations, how does that actually come into DOT and get distributed to uh, the districts and to the, the, the projects? So uh, depending upon the funding type, the allocations are distributed by formula or by 
formula, so population, or, or, or a specific program target. And what a program target is, is for example, resurfacing. We're required to keep our system up to a certain standard. And so depending upon different districts, how they're performing, uh, the targets will fluctuate and funding will go to a district that has, uh, that's not performing well in, uh, in payment ratings. So uh, the district allocated funds um, are broken down into state and federal uh, with different requirements. And uh, they're programmed onto the projects at the district level. So if the district office in Tampa is where we make the decisions on how to program those funds. Central office managed funds are also state and federal as well. Uh, but those programming decisions are made at the statewide level, uh, looking at all the projects and all the needs across the state. Uh, and sometimes they're distributed by formula and sometimes they're distributed by a uh, competitive process. So uh, if you uh, are having trouble sleeping at night, you can take a look at our work program and you'll see these specific fund codes. <laughs> this explains what they are and what they're, uh, basically who makes the decisions. This was a specific request that we were asked to kind of explain. And so district managed state funds, some of those funds include uh, the, uh, a, lot, a lot of the local grants that we provide, so the Transportation Regional Incentive Program, uh, our district dedicated revenue that we use to basically uh, fund our preliminary engineering program and our planning. Um, district managed federal funds, however, um, an example of that would be the surface transportation program, which are the funds that are primarily going to MPO priorities, uh, transportation alternatives, um, and then also uh, MPO planning funds as well. At the state level is where the decisions are made about uh, the strategic and goal system and where those funds uh, are allocated, uh, as well as uh, other programs like SunTrail. Uh, for federal uh, federal decisions at the state level, the federal funding decisions at the state level, those include safe route to school, uh, a lot of the planning programs, and then um, our assist advanced construction, and some of the others that sit there, bridge replacement as well. Okay, now the fun part. Ming is going to give you an overview of how all this translates into what programs are available uh, for transit projects. Right, thanks, Stephen. If Stephen didn't confuse you enough, I'm going to confuse you more. Well, good morning. Good morning. Um, so, uh, Stephen gave you the overall big picture on um, state federal funding coming to the department. So I'm going to drill down a little bit and give you a brief overview of the state transit program. So um, as you know, the, the department does not operate any transit service. However, we are funding partners to uh, issuing grants to a partnering agency. So there are two different types of grant, formula grant and discretionary grants. Um, so I'm going to go into each one of them. So we only have one formula grant uh, under transit in the state, and it's a state block grant. Um, how it works is it goes, uh, goes by the exact same criteria as the Federal Transit Administration um, grant program for urban and rural area, the 5307 and 5311. So uh, there's a whole nother set of uh, uh, federal regulation that we do. Uh, but uh, the bottom line is we um, look at a formula based on population, revenue miles, and ridership, and distribute that grant money to each transit agency uh, within the state. And that's, that's basically a state uh, block grant program. The only requirement we have different than the federal regulation is we require a transit development plan to be submitted every year, either a updated one or a every five year uh, they submit a new one for us to review and concur. Um, so that's the only uh, requirement that's different than the, than the federal requirement as far as the block grant is concerned. So there are quite a few of discretionary grant programs um, and then the state transit programs. I'm going to go over each one of them in the next few slides. Um, the service development program, which is a very popular program with our transit agencies. So every time um, the transit agency want to try something different uh, with the existing route or have a new route uh, develop or try different technology, different uh, uh, approach to providing transit service, um, we use this uh, tra uh, transit service development program. So example of that um, is the uh, Tampa streetcar. You know, we uh, provide free fare. Um, we use that transit development program uh, for that. Um, some other uh, projects uh, under that program include the, uh, uh, the cross state ferry. Uh, we use that because that's some sort of new technology, new services coming to the area. And uh, another one is the I-275 bus and shoulder pilot project. So uh, those type of projects that we use the uh, service development program. So 
to get funding from this program, you have to apply um, for the program annually. Um, we get application every spring, and uh, we review the application and submit our priority up to central office. Central office actually make the final decision on what project to, uh, to fund. Um, oh, one thing I want to bring up is the, the service development program only goes for three years. We can only put money on any uh, project no more than three years. But beyond that, we cannot continue on the project. Um, the transit portal program, um, actually, um, every county um, within the district actually benefit from, um, uh, from this program. We usually um, use that pro this program to fund transit corridor, um, transit services for particular corridors. So, say in, uh, uh, in Pinellas, we have the 100 and 300X, you know, from Pinellas to, to Hillsboro. Uh, we funded that, uh, those two, uh, two routes. Um, in Pasco, we have the Route 19 and Route 54, which is funded under the, uh, the Transit Corridor Program. Um, in Hillsboro, uh, we also have the, the 20X, um, which is also a regional route, and uh, you know, 275 going from Wesley Chapel all the way to the airport. Those routes are also funded by the Transit Corridor Program. Again, just like the um, Service Development Program, um, you submit application every year, and we do um, look at the performance of each route every year. We look at the ridership. If it's performing, we continue to fund the project. If not, we have to consider making changes or maybe just continue funding the project. Can I, can I ask a question? Can you go yeah. back to that one for just a second? How do you determine uh, in the FDOT participation whether um, it, it is designed to alleviate congestion? How does that determination get made for the 100% funding versus the 50%? Well, the 100% funding usually we look at regional routes. Um, that's why we look at um, say the 100 300 acts, that's pretty obvious in Cross County, the 19 in Cross County, even for the 54, which is connected. The 19 route, you know, people can actually go from Penelas all the way to Central Hill, you know, just by going through the 19 and 54 route. And also the 275 LX, you know, that's pretty obvious. You know, you take folks from Wesley Chapel all the way into the airport. Um, it, we don't really have a, like, some sort of modeling just to see. Um, you know, how, how many cars are actually going to take, take, that, take away from uh, the interstate, you know, by running 275, say. Um, but we have to look at the, the forecast and look at the service. Again, like I said, we continue to monitor it annually, you know, perform. So that's, that's how we do it. I think so far we have not asked any transit agency to match this fund. I think so far all the routes have been funded 100%. Um, we have not asked for any local participation uh, under the transit quarter program at this point. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask everyone to do this, but let's, so before we all jump in and ask me questions, um, are you done with your questions? Uh, Is that your last I'm slide? done with this slide. No, I have quite a few more. You have a question to ask, please. Yeah. So, so we don't forget. Take them now yeah. or wait again? I'll take them now. Okay. I normally would think it would be good to just take them at the end, but this is such a complex and I <laughs> slide to. breaks and so much of stuff, and I won't even remember where to go back to. That I'm just Said. So, uh, and, and because of your question there, so when you judge this, um, you say to relieve congestion, and you say that naturally the regional routes will be, so it's not, so if the regional route, which is typically true of commuter routes all over the country, the regional route routes have uh, far less ridership um, than local routes do, so, but, so that's not part of any judgment. Coming in, I think. <laughs> um, all over the country, when they have the commuter routes that are the long routes, they yes. typically have fewer riders all the time. And yes. that's true for us, too, yeah. than a local route. So when mm -hmm. you said, I thought I heard you say that you look at relieving congestion, and you, it's just logical to look at the regional rather than the local. Yeah, so um, obviously, you know, there are many applications. Some apply actually for local local transit route and some apply for regional routes. So um, from the district point of view, we really have to look at the big picture, you know, serving different counties because within each county you have transit agency to fund those local routes. As far as regional route, there's really not a funding mechanism other than, you know, a state grant program. So we have to come in and, and, and help out, you know, funding that route. Um, unless 
you know, obviously, you know, transit agency can, can form partnership and fund those routes, then maybe we don't need to step in and help fund those routes. But as far as, you know, the... Uh, you need to switch mics? Yeah. 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 We're going to do it's not one. working? No, I think we're going to get out of service right now. Okay, thank you. Okay, so, um, and also I want to, I want to uh, point out the fact that um, the review process of both the transit quarter program and the uh, uh, service development program is not done by just DOT. Actually, we bring in a group, you know, we form a our type group, it's a regional transportation interagency exchange group. Um, they're, they're members from the Is MPO. That chart? No, <laughs> <laughs> so they actually uh, review the application and provide a recommendation to the department, and, and we go through the list and make them the final decision from the district perspective. Then we're going to submit that uh, to the central office for project. So, um, Ming, my, first of all, can you can you move that mic a little closer to you? Yeah. Thank you. Just the whole yes, stand. Um, and then my question is, I think one that I kind of brought up before when we talk about the uh, van pool is, and that uh, revolves around marketing because we can make these wonderful bus routes, but if our citizens don't know about it, you know, how, how do we increase the numbers of user uh, of the user? So. Do your funds include any marketing dollars, or um, you can certainly use that for marketing? So, whatever we give to the transit agency, if they decide to use part of it for marketing, they can certainly do that because um, all the programs include um, operation, capital, and also marketing. Um, one trying to mention is that there is a um, commuter assistance program. You know that uh, actually Key Bar is, is helping us to to run, and, and also all the uh, transportation management organizations, the TMO and like the Western Alliance, they promote use of uh, mass transit. So they can certainly do some of the marketing effort on your behalf. I think you just need to coordinate together, you know, amongst all the transit agencies, and and, and do a campaign. That, that would be great because I, I want to make sure our residents know that, and especially in the Western Chapel area, they want a, you know, an easy way to get to the airport. There's there's a, a bus for them, and, and but I, I would guess most of them don't even know that that exists. So I just okay. think we need to do a better job. Yes, I, I think that that's a very good point, and um, I think in the next round of, um, of application solicitation um, for the community assistance program, perhaps that's something we need to do some emphasis on. Anybody? Oh. Thank you. Um, did I hear you say, I mean, maybe I misunderstood what you said, but did I hear you say that you don't have a measurement of the effectiveness of adding transit to a regional project and how that applies to a congestion management plan? We do. But when when the application come in, when there's no history on the performance, like someone when they start a route, you know, some agencies, um, say going from Pasco, you know, into uh, Tampa International Airport, there's no history. You know, how do you measure that? That's why we have a monitoring program on a yearly basis. So every year we go back to the route and look at the ridership, look how it performs, and we work with transit agency on that. Okay, so, well, we're not reinventing a new wheel. My point, my point is there are, you know, there are agencies all across the country that based on either frequency or, or outreach so that people know it, length of being in place so people adopt it, but then the numbers of people that get on it reflect the takeaway um, from the congestion on the road. Right. So I, I know there's got to be a methodology. That's why I'm like, uh, it, I understand there's not a methodology on, the, on a new route. <laughs> but if we could set benchmarks for performance that would help agencies know what the right thing to do and share that information on established routes that are finding success, that would probably be a real benefit to organizations that are trying to put a, a new plan in place to help them find the greatest success. 
Sure, and and I totally agree with you. And and the measurement that that we use for for those programs is really no different than what the transit agencies use, because transit agency they they operate those routes. So although we give them the grant at the beginning, you know, not only exactly how many riders you're going to capture, but obviously the transit agency has done their research, you know, looked at the ridership potential, looked at the population and employment growth, and and all the, the uh, activity center try to connect. I mean that is a projection. But once service is in place, they're being measured just like any other transit route. Within transit agency. Thank you. Um, yep. Yes, and then after you then um jump. Oh, and then I have one. All right, thank you. Um, so I may not say this correctly because even in my own mind I'm trying to form my thought process, but I want to just make some comments about what I think. I can't remember who's, which um, I'm not sure who made the comment, but it was about getting the message out there. And so to that point, I look around this room and I see an awful lot of very bright people who are working very hard on trying to solve our congestion and transportation issues, not only in our own counties, but in our region. And for those of us that have been around in the public arena for a while, you know that these conversations have been going on for 50 years. And had we been making real decisions 50 years ago with all of these thoughts that we're learning about today in mind, we wouldn't have the problems that we're having today. And because it's a very complicated um, formula that is used to fund these projects, and because every county and state, and even at the federal level, <laughs> things keep changing, it's very, very difficult. So for those of us that have immer immersed ourselves in it, how difficult it is for us, Think about how even more difficult it is for the average citizen who is just busy going about their daily lives and trying to provide for their family and make ends meet and take care of their kids. I'm telling you that because I was especially struck by the comments that Mr. Pete Franco made with regard to the project we're trying to do that takes folks from downtown St. Pete out to St. Pete Beach. And Sharon Giroux, when she spoke I'm about... Not Sharon I'm sorry? I'm not Sharon Giroux. Sharon Giroux. No, no, but... I know, but you got my name wrong. I apologize. Thank you. I, I just apologize. Just you got the Sharon. <laughs> I got the Sharon right, right? I apologize. Uh, it, it, it is one of the things that I think about, especially now, going into the hurricane season. What we are really focused on is trying to ensure that we do the right things for public health and safety reasons to provide for the opportunity to move large masses of people throughout our region in the event of a major critical storm. And that's critical to moving forward. So. It is so important to get the facts right, you know, as a real, I just want to find out the microphone to say, we are not taking lanes away sure. with our project on sure. St. Pete Beach, number one. And number two, we are not using 60-foot buses. I just have to say that because that keeps on being projected to our citizens over and over and over and over again. And we have worked night and day to try to correct those statements. They're not. In South true. Pasadena, you are, and that's what's on your No, sir, we are yes, not. Yes, you are. No, sir, that's you are I'm wrong. Saying. I apologize, but you are wrong. Nevertheless, these issues are critical. Our citizens are depending on us, and I hope we don't lose sight of the long range plans. Thank you for your comments, Commissioner Overman, because around the world, we have examples of how they've gotten it right. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. That's okay. Yeah, so our motto up here is peace and pass so we want to make sure. <laughs> <laughs> but I think just to defend Epcot and to respond to the question from 
post row, f dot does have a robust small mechanism called PDAS. And all the transfer properties use it to kind of establish right here. And it has a lot of the components that we would use for our LFP model that shows socioeconomic data where population is growing. So it gives us a really good idea of the type of areas where transit can work. So they do have a robust system to measure, and transit properties rely on it. And if they're going to pay for the regional stuff, I think transit properties typically don't mind doing the marketing component because a lot of transit properties don't want to pay for the regional stuff. So I think without the F dot connection, we wouldn't have any regional services. So we're very fortunate. Okay, um, we're going to let Cassandra um, speak and then we're going to move on because we're on the schedule and we want to make sure you finish your presentation by 10.30. These are all really good questions and this, I want to let you know that this is a very powerful program for transit agencies and, you know, and John mentioned how we, how we use it. The problem with this program, which I think all of you, especially elected officials in the room, can help us with is there is not enough funding in this bucket. So while it is a great program, um, I, and if there is a policy that we could get up to 100%, there is a, not a single route that is funded through this program in PSTA that is funded at 100%, not a single one. And so there are PSTA funds that go into operating these routes. So the way that we can help transit through the DOT is to get more money in this bucket. Um, so we're going to move on and then we'll take comments again at the end. But we have to, we have to stay on the schedule for the people at meetings and we got we got to get through the agenda. Can you put the microphone here? Sorry. Sorry. Okay. okay. So, so um, okay, I'm going to move on to the next slide. Um, Intermodal development program. Um, that is a also very popular program, not only with transit agency, but also with um, airport or seaport. Um, good. Okay, so um, so basically this program is designed to facilitate intermodal movement of people and goods. So transit agency can apply for this for this grant, um, airport, um, seaport. Uh, one of the projects we funded is actually at Tampa International Airport between the Conrad and the new commercial development. We try to provide more bus space, more access space for automotive transportation coming to the airport. So those type of projects we try to fund. And again, this project, uh, this, this program is a 50-50 match between state and local. Park and ride. Uh, it's a pretty straightforward program. You know, park and ride, we have quite a few park and ride facilities within the district. Uh, I think there is one up here. I don't know. I don't know one up uh, here. Yeah, over by Austin. Yeah, okay. yeah. So, so the DOT will help uh, pay for Acquisition of right away, you know, maintenance and modification of those park and ride lots. Uh, oftentimes, we pay for resurfacing of the pavement because bus come in and out. We are here on the park and ride lot. The requirement is uh, we make uh, inspection of those park and ride lots uh, occasionally to make sure 60% of the space is being occupied on a regular basis. If it's not being used, we're going to take them off the list on the park and ride lot support program. New Start. I think this is the most interesting program, and uh, this is different than the FTA New Start program, but it is being used to match the federal funding uh, as, well, as well as the local funding for major capital improvement projects. So we all talk about the FTA New Start, Small Start, and often heard people say, "Well, we're going to ma match with state dollars." So that's where the money comes from. The New Start program. So basically, it follows the exact same project selection criteria as the FTA New Star Small Star program. So whatever um, FTA decide to fund, so we can fund up to 50% of the non-federal share of any major uh, transit project, like fixed skyway and BRT. So <coughs> certainly in our district, the only project is receiving the new start uh, funding is the Central Avenue BRT. So we have nine half million dollar program for this project. So for the benefit of everyone in this room, I just want to point out, in order to spend that nine and a half million dollar, PSTA has been able to capture the FTA dollar you know, for us to match that money with the state money. Just because the program 
doesn't mean the money is there already. So we have to get the, the FTA dollar into the project in order to spend the money. On the facts. On the facts. Yes, ma'am. So another project that's currently under consideration for the state new start program is a streetcar extension in downtown Tampa. Uh, I've been coordinating with the project staff on that project, and uh, you know, as soon as they they get through the FTA small start process and get a favorable rating, and we'll consider programming funding uh, on that. So that is something at the discretion of the district. Also need to, need to get support from the district secretary, Mr. Green, and uh, and also um, up in Tallahassee. So. It's a long process, and make it you know simple, but it's a very long process and, and coordination you know, between the district and central office. So um, I cover a lot of information in a very short presentation. Um, I'm sure you have a lot of questions. If you want to learn more about those programs in detail, um, let me know. I'd be happy to sit down with you and explain to you. And if you'd like to read a lot of stuff. Florida Statute 341. <laughs> <laughs> it's good stuff. <laughs> I spent a lot of time on that Florida Statute. So. Thank you, Ming. Um, I'm going to read a letter that the Pasco County Commission um, voted on unanimously in our meeting Tuesday. And then, Commissioner Kemp, if you still have a question, we have five minutes left before we go into the next section. So, if you want to ask a question, raise your hand so I know um, how long. You know, we should let uh, people speak. But this uh, is addressed to Commissioner Miller. It says, Ms. Commissioner Miller, we are writing in our role as the Pasco County Board of County Commissioners in support of the LRTP amendment requested by the Florida Department of Transportation on I-275 from north of Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard to Bears Avenue. We spelled Boulevard wrong, by the way. Um, to Bears Avenue. This will be under consideration at your June 11th public hearing. Adding these general use lanes is an important priority to help the flow of people and commerce throughout our region. Not moving forward will have a detrimental effect on the proposed regional BRT project. And as you are aware, this project is also a priority of the Tampa Bay Transportation Management Area Leadership Group. Thank you for your consideration on this important project and LRTP amendment. Please feel free to reach out if you have any questions. And then it's signed by all board members of Pasco County. And then I'll, I'll um, take this, have this go down to Commissioner Kim. I could ask a lot of questions about this, but I just, I wanted to, um, just a couple. One is um, in terms of uh, when you, when someone said, I think uh, that we're, or no, I guess Stephen, uh, that we are um, investing more statewide than other states, um, and that's just of our, our local gas tax dollars that we have, a more robust system that way? Uh, many state DOTs rely on all federal funds I see. to fund their, their program. We have the benefit of having a lot of state revenue and limited out numbers almost to the federal revenue. And as I understand it, we're missing a lot of revenue in the state of Florida because we don't have legacy transit systems, and whereas other um, states will have, or communities will have, transit systems that are uh, there that the uh, that are legacy transit systems that the federal government invests in as a matter of that we're, we're far below other. So, so as far as transit investment, the federal government invests. Um, into those projects to capital project. So as far as uh, um, operating and maintenance of those uh, uh, major tran transit components, it's up to the local to fund those. So um, so depend how you look at it. Um, okay. So and, but um, and d then just to go further, right now, FDOT is funding operations in Miami at fifty million for Tri-Rail. Is that correct? That was an agreement made very long time ago. Um, I think that that agreement um, was put together because of the I-95 construction, and and the state decided to continue to fund this, um, and I think through the legislature, um, that I think that was the agreement. I don't think we're going to see another agreement like this 
uh, in the state of Florida. I know there's a legislation allowing the, the state to fund commuter rail for up to seven years, the first seven years, and that's the case for SunRail. Um, I think in a couple of years, the operation of SunRail will be turned over to the locals, and they will be fully responsible for the operation and maintenance of the system. Okay. I just want, I just want to say that um, really, um, I can go into a lot of uh, no questions about this. <laughs> there's, there's a lot of great information presented. It was one of the most you know, strong presentations I've seen, and so that's why I, I thought it could merit further discussion, but I'd just like to point out that I just think what Ms. Borges said, and thank you so much, you, um, I think that is number one target, um, which for two and a half years, I think I thought that we would be discussing more of that as part of these groups of any group that I'm in, and that's that um, we need to be looking for operational funding, and that is what we are so lacking. And so I thank you for pointing that out because I think as a region, we are just not doing that. I've not heard that conversation brought up, and I think that's most like important uh, thought I've heard that we should move on in two and a half years as a group in a region that we should be looking for operational funding um, for uh, transit operations in, in our region. You know, at the uh, Casco County Board of Commissioners meeting, we, we talked extensively for us to write a letter, which uh, Commissioner Stark mentioned. Uh, we sent it to every member of the TMA, Hillsborough Commission, Casco uh, Pinellas Commission as well, just so everybody knew what we were thinking about. Uh, recently, we just attended the uh, MPOEC meeting where they had a training center. It kind of went over through all the programs where this program is going to match up with this program, and it's got to build. Everything's got to be lined up, otherwise you lose the funding. Um, I, I think it'd be great if the Secretary of DOT, Mr. Nguyen, would maybe elaborate a little bit about how important this letter reflects to the funding and the, you know, we have to have this amendment done as well, and how it's detrimental losing the funding if we don't take this next step. So basically, we're talking about strategic intermodal system funding. And so, as, as you know, FDOT is not a local. We don't look at a local area in, in isolation. We look at the region and the state as a whole. And the legislator set, set up the strategic intermodal system for projects that will promote regional travel, regional movement of goods. And so that's when we go and we compete for that money at the state level. Um, if we, if we don't appear to have a regional consensus, it makes it very difficult to compete with Orlando, where Metroplan comes in with the consensus of their Metroplan board, where we get other regions coming in. Um, the importance of the amendment next week is, is that if, if it was to fail, and I don't have any idea that it would, but if it was to fail, um, I'd be giving 80 million back to Tallahassee. Um, to figure out, I'd fight to try to get it back somewhere, but I don't know that I'll be successful. We lost 600 and some million on West Shore that went to Orlando. I think speaking as a region in those regards for strategic intermodal system funding is very important. Um, for a lot of other funds, it's not as much because they're given out by formula or they're given out by a grant program. But for the strategic intermodal system funding, um, it's important. What I'll tell you also is, is we are on the brink of doing some pretty big transit projects. I can tell you Federal Transit Administration also looks at what do they think is going to be the reliability of the support for a project before they will submit their funding. And so if they don't see the full support, there's a very good chance that they'll send it somewhere else because that's not just competitive in the state, that's competitive across the country. And a good example was, if you, and some of you may remember, and I lived through it in Orlando, but in the 90s, there was a beautiful light rail system that was going to be built in Orlando. What you remember? We took those projects all the way up to 60% planned. We were ready to go to construction. The county commission decided they flipped their vote, and they said, we no longer support that. That money went away. Now you've got a light rail system in Charlotte that everybody loves. That was supposed to be in Orlando. Right. That just shows you, if they think you're not going to be stable, they don't think you're going to be consistent, you're probably going to have a hard time convincing them to put the money in because that, that happens to them more often than you think. So that's where I think the regional consensus comes in. 
for the strategic and model system money in, in the future for more federal transit money. Um, okay. We're just I'll um, Secretary Glenn and I have had a lot of little conversations about what we're going to do in our area and being here after 35 years and wondering why we can't say the word rail out loud. Um, <clears throat> when we talk about regional projects, um, I see you know the Pinellas solution for the BRT as a local, regional, coordinated plan. I see our, the BRT that's being spoken about in Hillsborough County that can serve Pasco to the airport and, and throughout the region, ultimately at some point in time, as a starter plan. What is a true regional project that we need to get on board with and speak with a common voice so that we can actually qualify for it is an opportunity to use you know, the, the right of way, whatever it looks like, the right of way of what is consistently and was this community in this region was founded by is the rail that's in the ground now. And we need to start that process. Because if we want to move people very quickly out of an area, reliably, without them getting stuck on roads, we have a statewide regional rail system that can move people faster than any other way. So I know it's a longer term project. We have our starter projects to get us there. When we're looking at our roads and our transportation networks, they are obviously a part of the process. But when we are truly intermodal transportation planning focused on a balanced way, we can actually do a lot. And to the Secretary's point, when we talk out of one voice, we'll get a shot of getting the funding we're looking for. And I'm hoping that someday we actually are really able to do that well. Not the way we want. So uh, one thing uh, as we transition into the um, new vision for park, I want to say about something we've done here in Pasco County is we have uh, we have changed our land use policies to build that support that will be necessary for transit. We have incentivized growth along the 54 corridor and try to uh, try to. Um, minimize sprawl. And we've used it not by taking away any property rights, but by incentivizing um, density along a, what will be one day a, tran you know, a transit corridor. And I, you know, we're happy to have our, our guys talk about that sometime, but we, are, uh, we have a, a really robust program that I think is doing well. You can drive down 54, 56, and look at what's going on. All right, so now we have a new vision for HART with um, Ben Limmer from HART. Okay, great. Um, is it okay if I don't use the microphone? Or we won't be able to hear you over here if we don't. Okay, yeah. great. We'll do that. So, once again, uh, Chair and members of the TMA, thanks for having me. My name is Ben Limmer. I'm the relatively new uh, CEO of the Transit Property in Middleborough County, Hart. Been uh, on the job about uh, nine weeks. Um, I've been in the transit world about 15, 20 years, most recently at the transit property in metropolitan Atlanta, known as MARTA. My role there was overseeing policy planning, external affairs. Um, I spent four years at MARTA. Before that, I've actually worked in two city halls, one the city of Atlanta on a couple of major infrastructure projects, and then also worked at the uh, city of Cleveland. Uh, I also spent about 10 years in Phoenix, Arizona, where I worked on multiple New Starts, federal New Starts projects, uh, both in Georgia and in Phoenix, and actually a bus rapid transit also in Cleveland, Ohio. So I worked on maybe between 10 and 15 New starts and small starts projects, everything from bus rapid transit to street guard to light rail, um, as well as heavy rail projects. So really the full gauntlet um, of transit options. Also, um, something that's pretty interesting, I've also worked in two states that provided absolutely nothing with regards to transit funding support. So 
I'm absolutely delighted to be in Florida, which really leads the nation uh, in funding public transportation, whether it's both capital and operating support. So excellent presentation. Uh, Secretary Gwynn and his whole team does a great job of being uh, transit supporters. Uh, just a little bit about heart. Um, it's you know it's four years old. We serve thirty five thousand people per day. Uh, what I would say to this though is we have a rapidly growing region. You all know this. I'm you know I'm not telling you anything you do not know. Um, and uh, the size of our transit system has been underfunded for decades, and we're, we are continuing to grow. And it's going to take substantial investment in our transit systems and throughout our entire region in order to keep up and manage that growth into the future. Um, however, in Hillsboro, that's uh, that's changing. Um, last fall, and I'll talk about this on the next slide, but last fall the, the voters approved a one cent sales tax that's going to go fund uh, transportation improvements throughout the county. Hart's going to be the receiver of a little bit less than half of those funds. Uh, so the size of the transit agency is going to completely change. Um, it's going to change so much that uh, change is not an appropriate term. I use the term transformation. It's going to completely transform who it is today um, very, very quickly. So in order to be successful at managing a full transformation of any governmental agency, especially a transit agency, is to rethink how you do things. Everything from how you orient your service towards customers, how you communicate with the community, um, what your overall value is to the economic growth of the area that you serve. Um, we need to think big. I know that there's been 50 years of planning done. Uh, we've had a lot of time to plan, but in the past we planned a plan, now we can plan to build. Uh, need to think about multimodal. I treat them all equally. I love them all, whether it's local bus and circulator or uh, rail options and everything in between. It's just what transportation challenge are you trying to, to solve and then what's the best type of transit solution in order to solve that problem. And um, inside of Bart and throughout the community, I'm really focused, this is sort of my bottom line, is building a culture of excellence throughout the organization and throughout the county. I mentioned the uh, one cent sales tax hard set to receive beginning next year, assuming the litigation is resolved in favor of public transportation investment. Hard set to receive $130 million per year next year. Um, the uh, charter amendment that was part of the half cent sales or the one cent sales tax referendum had some specifics regarding how it's invested in public transit. Um, it says that 45% of the transit funds should go towards expanding bus service. About 35 goes into investing in fixed guideway um, options. And I, I want to stress within that 35% for fixed guideway, in order to receive federal funding, you need to reserve 20 years of operations and maintenance funding before the fence will give you a dime. So the day-to-day -day operations will come out of those funds. And then 20% is for other uses. Um, again, uh, you know, I've worked on transit referendums and, uh, you know, several times actually. And generally the playbook is you have a specific list of projects and you know exactly when um, the projects are going to come to fruition. It was done differently in the transit referendum that I worked out in metropolitan Atlanta within the city back in 2016 and it was done differently here where um, it was more outlined of loose buckets of what you would spend the money on and then you would engage the community in exactly what type of expanded transit service they were looking for. It also allows you to be flexible and adapt to any transportation mobility changes with regards to um, overall technology. So it's a pretty innovative approach that the All for Transportation group made. Um, 
The charter amendment also includes what's called an independent oversight committee. And if you have any questions about this, Ms. Alden would be happy to answer them for me. <laughs> <laughs> but basically, it's, it, it, it is exactly what it sounds like. It's a 13-member group that's collecting all the plans from the individual project agencies or program agencies, which is the city, the cities within the county, the county itself, as well as HARP. And um, they can do some annual auditing, prepare an annual report, uh, and looking forward to getting started on those independent oversight committee meetings this summer. Uh, so what is HARP going to do? Uh, very much reflect the uh, breakdown in HARP share of the funds. We're looking to, um, of course, substantially expand bus service throughout the county. We are going to need to balance, so investing in the successful bus routes today with serving the entirety of the county. It's a very large county. People tell me it's the size of Rhode Island, and uh, a substantial portion of the county is not connected to heart at all today. So we are going to really have to balance those needs in order to meet all of the mobility needs that is uh, of the citizens that voted um, in favor of the tax. Uh, and then also create a long-range vision for the future. And what do I need to buy this? Is if we do invest in fixed skyway solutions, where and when and what type? So I'll get into that in just a moment. Um, speaking of what type, I mean, so I'm still relatively new. Um, and I've been on a listening tour, and yes, I've read some of the 50 years worth of plans. Um, <laughs> And, uh, you know, it's quite obvious we, we need to figure out a way to connect our employment centers, West Shore, downtown, and USF area. We have an excellent, wonderful airport as well to connect to. Um, so how do we do that? There's several different ways to do that, fixed guideway uh, corridors, which could include uh, bus rapid transit, uh, specifically. Um, and then also somebody mentioned, may mentioned the... Um, uh, streetcar project, uh, Hearts partnering with the city, a huge priority of Heart in the city is to extend the streetcar further north to the heights as well as what's called modernized the downtown streetcar which will buy new vehicles and make some improvements to the track to make it uh, operate faster. So. Uh, so related to bus service, we're actually going to accelerate the implementation of bus service plans we have on the books for the next five years beginning uh, in January and or whenever the litigation is resolved. We're also going to look at restoring some of the service reductions that were implemented in the fall of 2017. We're looking to bring those back um, as well as expand some of our mo most productive routes today. Uh, and again, looking at balancing that with expanding route options across the county. Uh, and then also, most, most critically, and I've heard this a lot from the community and the riding public, is investing in the, in the places where customers wait for the bus. Uh, bus shelters, transit centers uh, throughout the county as well. Uh, so also, uh, this you know, as I mentioned, this transit program did not have a specific set of projects tied to it. Over the next year plus, we're going to be engaging with the community, the stakeholders, to find out exactly what they are looking for with expanded public transportation options. It's going to take a whole lot of coordination, um, especially with this group as well. So I hope you'll have me back. And we're going to look at the overall financial program, partnering with FDOT. Uh, as well as assessing some of the technical needs as well. Um, and then lastly, very interested in using the local funds. $130 million sounds like a lot of money per year, and it is a lot of money per year, but there's ample opportunities to leverage that to secure additional state and federal dollars, but also opens up opportunities to, to partner with other entities as well. Um, I'm actually going to skip this. So with that, I'm going to conclude with this. Um, first of all, there's, you know, you all represent organizations throughout the uh, region. 
if there's any organization you'd like to have a conversation with Hart about, I'm more than willing and able uh, to talk to you about uh, what what Hart's plans are. Um, also, if you have any ideas on weighing in about what the priority should be or people to talk to, I'm all ears with that as well. Uh, with that, that concludes the presentation. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much, and we have a question over here, Commissioner. Oh no, that's from before. <laughs> Wonderful. Any questions on the hard presentation? Thank you. Just a quick question. In general, with your experience, how important is it for a region to speak with one solid voice when we're looking for programs to get started, even starting small to get bigger later on? How important is that voice to get funded? Not only, obviously, for the state program, but with the federal program. Oh, it's. Um, absolutely vital because uh, when you're pursuing support especially from the federal government you, you all need to be on the same page when I was working on the light rail and the streetcar program in Phoenix I actually had to get on the same page with Tucson which is 125 miles away because we were both pursuing federal grants at the same time and we were both located in the same place so regional coordination is absolutely essential to get on the same page so you don't go seeking funding opportunities from the same trough at the same time. Um, also, though, thinking even larger, and that thought plays a very proactive leadership role. Uh, so that that certainly bodes well for Florida's future. Great. All right. So seeing no more questions, we're going to move on to Carl's presentation. And we're glad to have some of your experience here in the in the area. Yeah. Uh, well, that's being worked on. I've heard a couple times questions about regional coordination, speaking with that unified voice. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I spent about 15 years working for Illinois DOT. I worked in their equivalent of the work program office. Up there, they called it urban program planning. And I want to echo the remarks of the secretary and also your question. I can tell you that when I went out and met with local officials in regions, if there was not a unified voice, we stepped away. We took our checkbook elsewhere, and we wouldn't support it to go to a federal competitive funding. So that unified voice is vital. Without it, the funding just isn't there. All right, excellent, thank you. Uh, so I was asked to come by and do a follow-up presentation from the last meeting related to the legislature at that time. At our last meeting, the legislature was in session. We now have the final results, so let me walk you through this. And um, I guess overall, first of all, on the legislature itself, we had a very, I would say, smooth session. I mean, it may not have felt like it at particular moments in time, but it was a very conciliatory tone. The legislative leaders were cooperative with each other, supported each other, and they advanced their agendas. Um, it was not a good session necessarily for this Florida, um, and home rule still did uh, take some lumps here and there. Uh, but of course, transportation, I have to say, uh, it was a very good session. A uh, $10.8 billion program, and I will point out, only about $2.5 billion of that is federally funded. So there's a lot of state resources coming to transportation and investing in our system. And if you look nationally, we are an odd state in that regard. Many states are doing the minimum they can to match those federal funds. Louisiana, for example, is using toll credits to match federal funds because they don't have the actual cash on hand. And last I heard, they were burning toll credits faster than they were making them. So they were going to turn back money to the federal government. And I'll give the department here in Florida a great compliment. They were very successful in what we call August redistribution. If you can't spend it, we get it. So, compliments on that. Uh, so, on this presentation, I want to talk about key bills and the budget. Key bills being ones that relate to us in transportation. Uh, these will be the bills I want to cover, and I'm doing a slide on each one. I'll move through them pretty quickly so that we can honor the schedule here. Uh, so, the discretionary sales tax. Uh, originally, this bill in the House did require a two-thirds vote to pass. That was taken up by the Senate. Uh, so now a sales tax referendum must be on a general election ballot, so you can't do it on a primary. 
And the idea was there's greater turnout on general elections, so it's more reflective of the region or the community, the voters. Uh, however, 180 days prior to that referendum appearing on the ballot, it has to be registered with the Office of Program Policy Analysis and Government Accountability. I have no idea where that address is located, but I'm sure we can find it on the internet. And I had to write that one up because I would We know that from <laughs> um, Okay, this one was real important for transportation. This is basically your texting and driving bill. Uh, we are one, but were one of four states that did not have this as primary enforcement. It was already on the books that texting while driving was illegal, but you couldn't be stopped for it. You can be stopped for something else and have this talked about during the discussion with someone who maybe wears a badge and can issue you a summons or a ticket. Um, now it will be a primary offense. So you can be stopped solely for this activity. The primary thing I will point out is for only texting while driving. You can still pick up your phone and check Facebook, theoretically. What about a red light? If the vehicle is not moving, so at a red light, at a stop sign, you are free to text. Once the vehicle is in motion, you are not to be texting. Uh, obviously, the difficulty for law enforcement will be distinguishing what you are doing on that phone. You know, I was dialing my grandmother. It's her birthday today. Now it looked like you were texting. So that would be an issue. Uh, actual tickets begin January 1st, starting with October warnings. Uh, motor vehicles and railroad trains. This was really a uh, driven somewhat by Southeast Florida, but if you do an entertaining rail transit here that is at ground level, uh, current status is a train and the car meet each other. Usually the car loses and someone passes away. Every person on the train was considered a witness under the law. You had to interview everybody on the train whether or not they saw something. Now, you just interview people who actually saw something. So it will speed up the clearing of crashes. Uh, transportation. This bill was very misleading and caused a lot of people concern. Let's call this the Miami Dade bill. This was a local issue. They were dealing with some internal things going on there. You do not need to worry about this bill. So if you see this, because it is going to be presented to the governor, it hasn't been sent to him yet. If he signs it and it makes the press, it only applies to Miami Dade. Don't want anybody getting nervous here. Okay, the scooter bill. Uh, this went through various iterations, it did pass, we have to allow scooters, but you as local units of government have the right to say where they can be used. One of the things that was very important on this bill was it reserved a maximum speed of 20 miles an hour to be a scooter. Now, you get too fast on a scooter and you hit a pedestrian, it's not going to end well for the pedestrian. Uh, by limiting it to 20 miles an hour, there's that safety aspect. Again, you have a right to say you cannot use scooters in certain areas where it's really not appropriate. Also, during a hurricane, when one's approaching, or a tropical storm, they have to be secured under this law. Uh, motor vehicle racing, uh, basically it increased the penalties for drag racing, street racing, whatever you want to call it, and you can now be taken to jail on site, even though this is a misdemeanor crime. Uh, it's just a safety bill that was really necessary, very Pleased to see us advancing this bill forward. Uh, Department of Transportation. There's usually a general transportation bill. This one came through this year. Uh, deals with uh, aggregate specifications with local use of government. There's about six different aggregate combinations. Some local use of governments were specifying only one could be used. They said, hey, look, if it works for the department, it should work for you. Um, it also limits that uh, contractors who are bidding on jobs above 50 million have to have a couple smaller jobs under their belt first to have a track record of accomplishments before going for a really big job. Um, and then also the small county outreach program, SCOP, it raised that threshold from 170,000 population to 200,000 population. Uh, this is the uh, what's been called the toll road bill. Uh, Senator Galvano's, President Galvano, or Senate President Galvano's, um, his initiative, and this has the M cores. It uh, directs the department to look at three different corridors, to have uh, working groups that will advance these, and MPOs are part of the listed agencies or entities that will be part of the advisory groups. 
Uh, task force have to have a report back by October 1 of next year. Construction beginning by December 31st, 2022, and open to traffic by 2030. It does include an additional $135 million per year into the Transportation Trust Fund. Uh, currently, the, whenever you renew your license plates, about half of that money goes to general revenue, half of it goes to the Transportation Trust Fund. All of it will go to the Transportation Trust Fund. It's staggered or increases its way up to 100%. But it will increase the funding to transportation by about $135 million per year. About $109 million of that money is eligible for any use. Some of the monies between 135 and 109 are specified where they will go, such as small county outreach program. And then uh, the budget. So as of yesterday, it was not yet presented to the governor. I have not checked this morning yet because I was driving here, and we're not supposed to be using our phones while we drive. I want to be good about that. <laughs> I want to make sure I got here. Um, I hate being late. But anyway, uh, the total budget was about $91 billion. That supports about 113,000 state employees. Uh, some highlights on it, $21 billion for education, uh, $33 million for state land purchasing. The Sadowski Housing Fund came in at $200 million, which is a high for that. Uh, it is a trust fund. Um, some money for Hurricane Michael, as well as for water quality and protection. But I think what you're interested in is transportation. $10.8 billion, which is a phenomenal budget. Think about that in relation to a $91 billion statewide budget. So of every $9, we're getting one. That's very impressive. Uh, that supports about 6,200 state employees within the Department of Transportation. There were $85 million worth of earmarks, which the governor can line out of veto. We will see what happens to those. Uh, last year, that number was about $150 million, and then after line item vetoes, it's about $50 million. Do you have um, a list of those line items? I've um, never seen I can get it out of the... I think we all like to see it. I'll be happy to email it out to your executive directors who can share it. Um, I did look it up previously, so I've got it handy. Um, I will tell you, the legislature and the governor have a great deal of trust in the department. And there's well-founded. The department has a strong track record up to the liberty, bringing projects, getting them done, um, and doing it as promised. And that is really reflected in the amount of money you're seeing here. This trust fund was not touched, whereas other trust funds were taken, money's removed, put into other spending purposes. So that speaks volumes right there. And as an aside, I will tell you, just the DUT and their ability to work with local units of government such as yourself, I encourage you to talk to other states. They will laugh when they, your DOT does what? They actually come to your meetings and talk to you? Because that doesn't happen elsewhere. Again, that's reflected in the trust the legislature has in DOT. So, my compliments. All right, during the legislative session, I do a newsletter, I always promote this. If you're not getting it, See me, give me a business card, I'll get you on that list. And then at our last meeting, we talked a little bit about the earmarks and kind of the ups and downs of these. Let's talk a little bit about earmarks, okay? Those are not the earmarks I'm talking about. What I'd like to talk about is the ones that we saw in the bill in the budget of 85 million. Uh, earmarks tend to do more harm than good because they eat up money that could be going to other priorities. Priorities you have established through your MPO process where you use a quantifiable methodology to determine the highest and best use of money. The same thing the department does through work program where they take a statewide view and they are doing a quantifiable, measurable process to put money to its best use. Well, when you have your own, it undermines the process that you have as an MPO, the process in work program, and it takes a project and essentially says, I'm going to bypass the whole thing and go to the top of the list. So it takes money away from you and your ability to do things that are needed for your region. Because basically, the department's going to get so much money, there's going to be so much money for a district, and that earmark comes off the top. 
And then the remaining money is what gets left for the department and yourselves to determine how it should be used to serve the traveling public, whether they be our residents or visitors. Here's the hitch. If the governor decides he doesn't like that project, draws a line through it, the proverbial red pen, I don't know if it's actually red, but let's just say it is, the money and the project are gone. It doesn't come back. It's not like, oh, that $50 million project is gone. Here's the money. You can use it how you want. No, it's just gone. It evaporates. So you've lost the money. You've lost the project. And worse than that, if it's one of your priorities, the department's prohibited from spending money on it for that year because the governor's expressly said, no, we will not do the project. So in summary, earmarks are a bad idea. And I would encourage you to not for your marks. So that wraps me up. I'd be happy to uh, take any questions right after I leave, and I'll take Ben's idea and let Beth answer them. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll have, be happy to take any questions you have for me. All right, so we'll start here and then we'll go first. Thanks, Carl. That's very helpful. Um, I think one of the challenges we have at the NPO is that we often don't know about your marks because they are done either by a local government or by a county. And what we've tried to do is reach out to all of the intergovernmental affairs uh, staff members of our 25 local governments and ask them, you know, what are your legislative priorities so that we can look and see how we can match and support that project if, if it's worthwhile. But we often don't know. I was at uh, one of our cities uh, this past week, and uh, Representative Jamie Grant came and spoke to them. And uh, he talked about getting $1 million in the budget for, um, I forget the name of the road. But it was a road I didn't even hear of. I've never heard of. And it's a <laughs> local road in the city of Oldsmar that, that connects their industrial area. And it's not enough to even get the project done. If the governor vetoes that project, then we can't go to DOT for a year. Is that correct? So we have to wait until 2021 to pursue funds. That's correct. And you know what? And what you just expressed that commonly these earmarks are put in without the knowledge of the NPO. That is very common. Um, I've heard about that from across the state. I made a very similar presentation with Florida League of Cities last year, and it was a very unpopular presentation, but I work for you, not here, down. So I went ahead and did that. Uh, but yeah, that is a, a challenge because not everybody realizes that's coming through with the TPO ratio process. But I'm hoping if I can get the word out and everyone is aware of it, maybe we can get some some work through the MPOs rather than the legislative route. Um, I have a question, the same thing, kind of, because um, I saw that a legislator, and it was currently a last minute thing where they asked for money for a road uh, out in Brandon. So it wasn't on any of um, the priority list. So I, I don't know what the result of that was. And they said, when I asked our staff, they said they didn't. Hillsborough County came and supporting it, but they said they didn't even weren't even aware of this, how it could affect um, the FDOT funds. So, in terms of that road, it wasn't any priority for us. So, if it, like for instance, did get approved or whatever, it's not going to affect the general fund. True. It's like when it's just when it's not a repeated, and so it doesn't get. Um, you know, if it's not a repeated priority, it built our um, funding. Yeah. I guess so. Yeah. Go ahead. Faith and and there's some confusion on this. One thing, um, the number of earmarks, the 85 million, over half of it was in District 7. And if all of those go through, I've got to find 40 some million dollars. Where's there a, Just so you know, there's not one for Pasco. Right? There's a couple. Oh. What's your side drive or a few others? But, but, what, but the bigger, the, 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 really the issue that, that uh, I want to mention, if it gets vetoed, our budget goes down. The cash doesn't go down, but the budget goes down, which is our spending authority. So it means the money stays there, but we don't have the money, we don't have the authority to spend it. And so for every earmark that gets vetoed, our budget authority goes down by that amount. So even if it gets killed, we lose that budget authority. And in past years, we had a lot of reserves that were used to try to cover some of those, Hurricane Michael ate up almost all of that. And so my concern is, and I'm not saying I'm all hoping for a veto, but I wouldn't be disappointed. If, if we have to find that money, we're going to have to come to the MPOs and ask, what projects do you want to defer in order for that project to get built? So 
If it's in Hernando Citrus, we'll have to go to Hernando Citrus in view. If it's Hillsborough, we'll go to Hillsborough. Pinellas, Pinellas, Pasco, Pasco. So that, that's kind of the quantity we might, might be in. So I think somehow, though, we have to get our word to our counties. Um, I'll, I'll make sure. I mean, it's not, I, I don't know if you're even familiar with what this was, because I called in somebody from the county once that didn't know. I said, wait a second, I've heard that this is a problem, but it, it all happened after the fact. Um, and my second is, I just want to be clear that when I talk about operational funds, it is not a um, critique of uh, FDOT, um, but of our um, state legislature and priorities there. And, I, and even though there are states that don't do it, there are many states that do do it. Um, and look at operations, which I think is, is really um, a key thing. And I, so I'd like to see it as a priority. And the only way I think that becomes a priority is if uh, regional calls are for that to be part of the state. Uh, budget process. So I just want to make that clear. Um, and that's actually a perfect uh, reminder of what we spoke about at the last meeting. You had indicated that you were interested in making sure that the delegation was aware of our priorities and then possibly scheduling some joint meetings with our local delegations so that they are aware of you know, what we're concerned about and then we hear from them what they're being pinged for. Because the reason the priorities come for the legislature is because they're getting lobbied by certain elements that are outside of this conversation. And, and that doesn't necessarily mean you know, we didn't have them on our list either. You know, we had you know, sidewalks because we need sidewalks and we, we're not getting it through you know, the, some of the other processes. And because we've got kids in the dark and you know, seven o'clock in the morning with no sidewalk on a road because of either a lack of local planning or lack of you know overall planning it became a critical issue when they had to walk two miles to school and kids were getting killed so it became an earmark so where we can work together with our delegation and if we are in fact going to schedule some meetings i'd like to see when the target dates are those I think it's really critically important that we do that because, again, those earmarks do cost us. We're seeing the same thing happen in the Sadowski Trust Fund, where 125 is being swept, but of that 200,000 was literally for Michael disaster relief that now the feds are going to fund. So if he vetoes that Michael, because there's going to be enough, that doesn't come back to affordable housing this year. It just go, no, it goes back to the trust, but we can't use it. It's not part of the budget. So that's to your point. If you've got ear, $85 million worth of earmarks, if he videos all of them, that's $85 million out of our budget that we can't use for transportation. As it is, I think it's 120, 130, or something like that for the Michael that we can't use for affordable housing. So that, to your point, getting together with the legislature to lay our priorities and have those conversations is critically important for our success. All right, Mr. Long? Uh, He's getting his steps in. <laughs> Thank you very much. That's the, the next presentation. Just for clarification, I, I, I think I'm the only person on this group here who's a formal legislator, and I can tell you that uh, uh, legislators love to be able to talk about those dollars that they all bring back to their districts individually. And if you have a legislator who's pushing for a transportation appropriation, for example, and they are not on the Transportation Committee in the House of the Senate, that little tidbit of information is not something that they will know generally, number one. Because, you know, you go from being a local person to having to keep your fingers in the pulse of the entire state budget. So you learn those things that are appropriate for the committees you sit on. And I would venture to say that with Representative Grant, you probably doesn't know that it turns out to be a big negative thing for the Department of Transportation. So there is an opportunity for a little bit of education. and. The, if you take, you know, they've gotten in the habit now for years of rob, robbing our trust funds. The Sadowski Trust Fund is a great example. And once they make that sweep, if that money doesn't get used for whatever purpose they want, it does not go back to the trust. That's why there's no 
money there anymore. It goes into general revenue, and then they do whatever they want. So, great. All right, we're going to go to that, and then you're going to keep it and move it into the next. Actually, I was thinking this was a great segue into the next okay. item on the agenda, um, which is advancing legislative. Thank you. Just advancing <laughs> legislative priorities, and um, at the staff level, we've been talking about our uh, agendas for the next couple of TMA meetings. And uh, one of the things that it occurred to us is that since it's an early legislative session this next year, that our September meeting might be a, a good time to uh, try to come back to our legislators who may be in town and have a conversation um, about this group's legislative priorities. Um, you know, one of the things we can obviously draw on is the uh, priority list that this group approved uh, at the last meeting. Uh, I'm bringing that forward and talking about that. I mean, I'll, I'll reiterate the earlier comments about that that continues to be a challenging conversation. Uh, I had a one-on-one -on -one conversation with the representative from the Brandon area about the legis about the priorities, the project priorities from the TMA, and how we've all come together uh, around the region to support the West Shore interchange, and that this is our big ask, and we really, really need the support. And so, yes, it's disappointing to come back and have the conversation about earmarks. It just, I think, points to the need to continue to have that conversation, to have it again. Sometimes you have to say things 12, say, say things 12 times um, before the message really gets through. So um, I wanted to kind of open up this uh, conversation about uh, would we like to engage our legislative delegation? They've got a focus potentially of our September meeting, and uh, if so, uh, you know some of the highlights that we might want to make part of that meeting. Do you need a motion? <laughs> <laughs> Is there a second page? Yeah. 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 Can I just add a little bit to that? Thanks, Pat, for that meeting. Uh, we did have a conversation, and one strategy we may want to think about is if we could reach out to Representative Sprouts and Senator Simpson, who are in leadership, and ask them who are three point persons, one from each county, who could sort of carry water on transportation issues, and invite them to the September meeting. I don't know who those people are right now, and that may be changing, but uh, have them come, talk about our priorities, talk about what we want to see, send the message about the earmarks as well, and see if we can get some champions the legislature because I'm worried that if we try to meet with everybody, we spread ourselves too thin and um, it's hard to build that. You, you almost need some champions in the legislature. So if we could maybe follow that process, that would be a suggestion. Commissioner Long, then me. But that, I think that was a good idea. That's a, that is an <laughs> excellent suggestion for two reasons. Number one, we do have enormous strength in our Tampa Bay region in terms of both the House and the Senate. And uh, you know that, I think you know, that Senator Roussan and Senator Brandis are on those transportation committees in the Senate. I somewhat lost track of I'm sorry? I don't think Roussan is it. Uh -huh. he, he sure carried the water for Vanilla. Uh, yes, he is. And uh, Representative Sprouls, of course, is from uh, well, kind of. But he lives in East Lake, so yeah, um, yeah. So you get the point. We do have some very strong leadership, and it really is those four integral leaders of the House and the Senate that lead the way on the agenda for the entire legislature. So talking to them is worth. Gold compared to just trying to spread yourself to John Right? And I, I have a couple things that I want to add um, for discussion, just for y'all to think about it. It doesn't necessarily um, require any money, but I uh, I do a lot of traveling, as I'm sure many of you do, and I, I see a lot of new kinds of motorized vehicles being used. Uh, in countries and cities around the U.S. When we were in Nashville at the um, ULI meeting, you wouldn't believe how many scooters were, were around there. Um, and I wanted to start 
a discussion about maybe uh, when when you build a road, we're doing the complete streets now. You have sidewalks on both sides. And, um, and in Pasco, we're doing a multi-use trail on one side and a, I think a five-foot sidewalk on the other. And I rarely see anyone going down the highways on the sidewalk, but I think you will see them biking on the trails. But non-motorized, they only allow non-motorized vehicles. And I want to suggest that maybe yeah. we start looking at having one side be for non-motorized, but the other side be a pathway for motorized, because there are all kinds of um, people who want to use those, you know, single, those scooters or segways or who knows what's coming. And I think we should have our roads be prepared to be able to handle those, our trails. Uh, but right now they're they're not allowed. To, right? And then the other thing is in Pasco County. I don't think this is a problem in Hillsboro. Maybe in Southern Hillsboro you're going to get it. Um, but in Pasco County, we are starting to see a huge uh, spreading of COVID grass. And I've seen it in Hernando County. And what has happened in Hernando County really scares me because it's coming in Pasco. It's all along State Road 52. Now with the new construction that's been brought in. And COVID grass is one of the 10, the world's 10 most invasive plants. And we have to get a handle on it now, or we will never get a handle on it. It's no yeah. called COVID grass. You can look it up. It's very, very invasive. Nothing eats it. And to kill it, you have to spray it, mow it, spray it, mow it, spray it, mow it about three times. But when you mow the rights of way, you transport the seeds on the blades of the mower. So that they are being, the seeds of the COVID grass are being transported all around uh, the state and in, in, in our county. And, um, and it's, it's going to be a nightmare. I want to head it off before we get to what happened in Hernando Town. Okay, so does anyone else have anything for legislative? How do you spell that? I think it's C O O G A N or C O O G O N. C O G O N. C O G O N. And you, you think it's some nice little grass with some little white feathery plumes, and it's not. It's horrible. <coughs> Mr. Kent. Yeah, I think I'm going to have to agree with Mr. Kent. Uh, but, um, the, um, I just wanted to say, I understand the wisdom of asking only a few legislators, and if we asked all the ones from the three counties, we'd have more people here if they actually came than we have in this room now, so I get that. But I also get that our legislatures um, serve for uh, eight years. It's a really brief thing. Things have changed. There were lots of turnovers and have been, and so I think it would be wise to at least invite um, or let every let all the legislators know that such a thing is going on, so that if they wanted to be educated, they could be or involved or, or you know take part in it. Um, because I think it would be unwise to to not extend. That. Okay, so we're going to move on to the next part of our agenda, which is the TARDA Transit Development Plan. I will I will be leaving at eleven forty and turning the mic over to Commissioner Mariano. And the Mansfield project is being moved to the next meeting. Good morning, everyone. Pleased to be here today. My name is Bill Ball. I went to Mill Oliver, and I'm representing T. Barter today on the Envision 2030 Regional Transit Development Plan. I'll be very brief, late in the agenda, so I'm sure you'll be happy about that. What I want to do is just hit some highlights on what we've accomplished since we started a couple of months ago, where we're headed over the next couple of months, and we really welcome the opportunity to share with you where we're at with this, with this regional transit plan. I'm going to highlight the items on this slide, mostly talk about the things that we've been focusing on in the last couple of months. It's really a good, unique opportunity for TBARTA. This will be the first ever regional transit development plan for the Tampa Bay area. So not only will it be a good for the vision of transit over the next 10 years, it will also be important for TBARTA to help determine 
what its role will be in working towards that vision. Three things I want to talk about as it relates to the original TDP. The first one ties back to what Ming talked about earlier. It's really a requirement in Florida to be eligible to receive state block grant funding. So this would put TBART in a position to be eligible in the future. The second one is the most important one. It's really a strategy, a strategic blueprint, a strategic vision for the next 10 years that we can build consensus on and then work toward. And then thirdly, TBART can use it as a promotional tool, a marketing tool, basically a guidebook for implementing the plan. These are the key steps in producing the transit development plan. We follow that structure, um, but more importantly, we customize that to meet the specific needs of TBARDA in this case, and that being a regional plan. There are some guiding requirements from the TBARDA Act itself, as well as the TDP Florida statute that will follow along the way. It's a 10-year plan, this one going out to 2030. It is updated every five years in a major way. We talked about these requirements earlier as well. And in the end, we'll be asking the TBAR board to adopt this plan so that we can submit it to Florida DOT by September 1 of next year. Of course, it's the five-county region of TBARDA. This map shows the existing transit routes that currently operate in those five counties by the five transit agencies. So that's our focus and our starting point for identifying what's regional today and what we perceive should be regional in the coming 10 years. Okay, these are the team itself. We've got the TBARDA staff that's expanded quite a bit in the recent months since we started the project, so we have a lot of staff to work with now and leverage. We have the consultant team here as well. And then we're working closely with the technical advisory group that has representation from the transit agencies, from the workforce development groups, from both DOT districts that are involved in this plan, as well as... As well as uh, we added a representative from the MPO staff directors as well. So our second meeting of the TAG, meeting, or TAG group will be next week. We have a 16-month schedule. You can see we've made some progress already. And we're looking at having a draft plan in place by early next year, January, February. And then we'll be looking to have TBARDA adopt the plan in the April-May time frame of next year, well in advance of that September 1st deadline that FDOT has. Okay, some of the things I want to talk about. This is the most important slide today is conveying the project, project objectives. First one is compliance, making sure we meet the requirements that were set out in the TBAR Act. We're going to take care of that. The second one is the most important one, and that's coming up with that regional transit vision, working closely with the TAG and the local transit operators on what that regional transit vision will be. The third one uh, relates to triggering what TBAR's role will be in that process. Their organizational strategy, their financial strategy, and what roles they're going to play over the next 10 years as well. The fourth one is one that we've talked with TBAR staff closely about, and that's identifying some specific projects that could be implemented in the near term, having them ready and in place if and when funding were to become available. So our charge will be, and we'll talk about that, is, is defining those by the end of this calendar year so that we are ready to move those forward. And then finally, an action plan that lays out step by step how we're going to make this plan become a reality. Okay, the next one is the role in regional transit. Again, a big part of one of the objectives. And the TBAR to Act specifically identifies four areas that we should focus on in terms of what role and that TBAR should play in that process. They're identified in the slide transit operations, transit funding, transit policy, and collaboration with the local transit operators. We're going to focus on laying that out as part of the 10-year plan as well. One of the things we're going to do, or we're currently doing, is look at how other regional transit entities around the country are handling this process and identifying best practices that might be most applicable to the Tampa Bay area. For example, one that we're looking at is from Atlanta. The ATL. I'm sure Ben is very familiar with this one. So they have a lot of similarities to what we're talking about here. Multiple counties, multiple transit agencies. They have the responsibility for a regional transit plan. So we're going to look at that as an example as well as five other regional entities around the country to see what we can learn from them for, again, applicability here in Tampa. 
We do have some regional transit services out there today. Again, we talked about the transit corridor funding program funding a lot of these services. So we'll start with looking at that network. Um, what I will say is that the levels of service that are on these routes are not necessarily at the level that we would want them to be. So it's a starting point for existing conditions that we'll look at for expanding this and adding other, other uh, solutions as well over the 10 year vision period. We have been busy with public outreach over the last month. We've been out to five different events, one in each county at the major farmers markets. And we've made a lot of progress on the project website, getting information out there. We've been conducting a regional transit needs survey uh, that's been about a month in there. We've made a lot of progress and we've reached a little over 4,600 people so far. So we're looking to build up on that in the coming month. The regional survey will be continue to be open uh, through probably the first week in July. So we're going to continue building from that. One of the things that we're evaluating is where this representation is coming from by zip code so that we can focus on targeting some additional efforts in the coming weeks to try to get more representation from where we're not getting it today. Okay, and this is the emphasis on the early implementation projects. Again, the charge from David and the, the T-Barter group was to identify some basically low-hanging low fruit projects that are ready to be implemented. So if and when funding becomes available, we're ready to fund and implement at the, at the board's pleasure. These were some examples that we're going to start looking at, but we're going to identify some potential projects and define what those would be by the end of this calendar year. Next steps, uh, we're continuing with baseline conditions, really finalizing that, finalizing the first phase of outreach in the coming month, and trying to get some more of those surveys completed to support our assessment of needs, and moving forward with the technical evalu evaluation uh, over the summer. We're getting out, trying to get the word out with the number of presentations that we've done and are continuing to do. And uh, again, we welcome the opportunity to share and introduce the project to you today and, and look forward to coming back to you at a future meeting as well. With that, I'm glad to answer any questions or take any comments. So I, I do a newsletter, and I, I think there's some other commissioners do. Um, and I'm happy to put something on my newsletter if there's something you can give me that we can link out to your survey. Absolutely. We can include like a, a fact sheet about the project and a link to the survey. Right. Perfect. Commissioner Kent. I uh, just didn't recognize one of the things you put up there. MCAT Skyway Connections? Yes, they have a, what, a, a route that goes from, from Manatee into Pinellas County. It's somewhat limited right now, and it provides access to the VA hospital. So it's not at a level of service that it would be viable for commuters yet. So that's one example where we could potentially increase the service and make it more viable. So it's a bus route for you? Yes. Okay. okay, thank you. And just one other thing, when you do the surveys, are they um, I know you said you were going after areas where you're not hearing much, uh, but when we get the results of surveys, are we going to get a result based on um, population? We can, we'll have that information. We'll have to see if the, the sub areas are large enough to, to do, uh, I guess, by smaller sample sizes. So we'll, we'll do the best we can in that regard. For example, the bulk of our, oh, not the bulk, but about half of the responses so far have come from Hillsborough County. We might be able to do that for Hillsborough County. So we're trying to target, for example, Hernando County. We have not had a good response yet. So that's what we're going to focus on. Another place where we could uh, put, another place we could put information out, if we had some kind of uh, box or whatever that would hold flyers, is my tax collector's office. Um, we there, there are people in there all day long and. You know, getting their driver's license or whatever. If we had some some kind of vehicle that we could put flyers in, um, we could get that out. So we, we just have to do a better job on outreach. Is it okay? I guess the pleasure of the group if we sent an email to all of you that you could then in turn forward to the appropriate venues that you have. Absolutely. Okay. Great. And the libraries. Okay. Woo! We're rocking and rolling. Okay. Um, Thank you. <laughs> all right. We're not doing the so we're on updates and next steps. Who's doing that? Am I doing that? Yeah, I'll, I'll just start. Um, so last at your last meeting, you approved the regional TMA for the project. And just an update at our meeting on uh, Wednesday. Thank you. 
uh, we will be bringing forward our, for our TIP all of the projects that were approved by the TNA leadership group. Yeah, we're going next Tuesday to our board with the gym, and it has all of the regional opinion writers with all so we should see that next week. It's weird. <laughs> so we're we're also including the TMA priority list in the tip. Uh, and then in our, our rank order tip projects list, we've included all the ones that were recommended in Hillsborough County. The complete list is in the tip. Yeah. Right, and um, just uh, I'm looking at one of the pages here on our 2019 top priorities for multi use trails. And um, this, is, uh, this is a subject that's very dear to my heart, if you guys know me. And under construction right now is the Starkey Gap that is um, going to connect the Pinellas Trail to the Starkey Trail that connects to the Sun Coast Trail that's part of the coast to coast system. And um, it's actually being constructed by District 5. And uh, we, we do believe this trail will be done by the end of the summer. And we'll be having a, a ribbon cutting sometime in the fall that will coincide with the State Greenways and Trails Fall Council meeting. And so um, we'll send an invitation out to all of you. But this is such a great trail for the state. It will go from St. Petersburg all the way to Titusville when it's completed. And I think it'll be a, a trail of inter international draw. So look forward to inviting you all up for that ribbon cutting. And is there anything else more than TV?